Amen. I, uh, as we sing that song, I couldn't help but think, you can open your Bibles to Philippians, to where we were. You know, it's been three weeks since we've been in Philippians. It's been a, a while here. I feel like uh, it's been a long time since we've uh, been together in the Word there. It's good to be together in the Word this morning, but as we sang that song, I hope you remember that's exactly where we were three weeks ago when Paul writes, he's in prison, writes to the church, and he says, hey, church, in Philippians 2, verse 3, if you got your Bible open in Philippians 2, we'll be there in a a few minutes, but we were at verse 3 three weeks ago, and in verse 3 he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. And then he comes down there in verse 5 in, uh, in Philippians 2, and what does he say? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then if you keep reading in that text, I'll paraphrase it. He says, Jesus left heaven for you. And look at verse 8 in Philippians 2. What does he say? He humbled, humbled himself by becoming obedient. You see that word? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what we just sang about. That verse, that song that we just sang is right out of Scripture. You know, our awesome God did that for us. That's not part of the sermon. That's just bonus right now. But, you know, I just am like, man, you know, singing that song, glory to God, glory to God. But let's kind of do a quick review. We've been in Philippians. Philippians is written by Paul. Paul is in jail. Paul is chained to a guard. They change out guards. He's under house arrest, so to speak, though. He can still write. He can uh, send letters. He, we know he wrote to the Philippian church, to the church at Colossae, to the church at Ephesus. He uh, wrote uh, the book of Philemon all of that time while he's in prison. And so he writes to these people. And if you remember, if you got your Bible open, you go back over to chapter 1. And in uh, verse 12 in chapter 1, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances... Now what are his circumstances? He's in jail. He goes... My circumstances have turned out for the advancement of the gospel. He, what does he say? He goes, don't worry about the change. Don't worry about the bars. Worry about the gospel going out. That's a reminder to all of us in this room. We can sure get sidetracked. And he goes, remember the gospel. And if you remember, some of my favorite passages, challenging passages, is in that same chapter, in chapter 1, and he goes there in verse 20. And what does he say in chapter 1, verse 20? Cry, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read the whole verse. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything. That's not a pride thing. He's saying, I don't want to bring shame to the name of Jesus, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Wow. And you think, oh, well, that's just kind of mountaintop stuff. Well, look at the very next verse. In Philippians 1, verse 21, he goes, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's all the stuff we've looked at. You think, there's more? Oh, yeah, there's more. (laughs) You know? And he comes down in that same chapter, and he tells us there in verse 27, he says, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And in a way, we're still in under that umbrella in what we're going to be studying today. He has told the church there, apparently there is a little bit of fussing and fighting going on in the church at Philippi. If you go to chapter 4 and in verse 2 in chapter 4, he says, I urge Euodia and Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. He has called out selfishness. He's called out Uh, not to have division. If you go look at chapter 2 and in verse 14, he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you'll prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach. That's where we ended last week. But today, we are going to go be challenged. That's the only way I know how to say it. How's that to start off a sermon? But it's a challenging passage and looking at three lives. 
We're going to look at Timothy. We're going to look at Paul. And we're going to look at a funny name, Epaphroditus. You know, I love to say it, though, Epaphroditus. Isn't that a cool name? But anyway, we're going to look at those three lives. But before we dive into those three lives, I want you to stop and think. What is the call from Scripture for Christians? What does the Bible tell us about how we're to live as Christians? And, and, and this isn't in your notes or on the screen. Just go to Matthew and go to Matthew chapter 16. I want you to just see some verses. Some of these verses will be familiar to you. This particular passage is called out a number of times by Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says to his disciples, now listen to this, if anyone, did you catch that? If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now I don't know about you, that's underlined in my Bible, and even when I read it to you right now, wouldn't you agree those are some tough words? I mean, those are strong words. Deny yourself and follow me. By the way, that's not the only time Jesus says those words. They're called out all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I want you to go to one other passage before we dive into Philippians. Go to Romans, because Paul writes in Romans. Go to Romans chapter 12, and he has a very similar message in Romans 12. And many of you have heard this text. And in Romans 12, he says, Therefore, now the reason he's got therefore, he says, in light of being saved, he's talking to Christians. He goes, Therefore, I urge you. It's almost like I'm grabbing you by the shoulders. He goes, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, there's a whole sermon or more right there in that verse, but I want you to catch one thing he says there. He goes, Christians, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice that's acceptable to God, and that's your, if you study the wording there, that's your only reasonable way to worship God. Wow. Now, why did I go to all those verses before we even jump into Philippians? Because here's what I want you to hear. The Bible tells us we somehow have missed it. The Bible calls us to say, give of your life completely and fully to the Lord, 100%. Yield your life to Him. And yet, what do we sometimes think? Oh, well, you know, let's follow the Lord. We'll go to church at least a couple of times a month. We'll go to worship service. You know, I don't know about life group. I don't know about reading my Bible every day. I don't know about really surrendering my life fully, but I'll be a a pretty good old Joe, a pretty good Sally, so to speak, in this world. Now, you don't have to shake your heads right now, but wouldn't you agree that in a lot of cases, that's kind of how we've defined Christianity? But I want you to hear something before we start today. That is not how the Bible defines it. Just take those two verses I just read. In Matthew, he says, deny yourself and follow me. In Romans, he says, present your bodies. Listen, present your bodies as a sacrifice? I mean, you get that picture? Lay yourself on an altar as a sacrifice. That's God's call to our life. So about right now, you're going, hey, can I leave the room now? This looks like it's going to be a little heavy. But no, hang with me. We're going to look at three lives. What I want you to hear as we dive in is our life is to be fully serving Christ and the church. Our life is is to be fully serving Christ and the church. And secondly, what I want you to stop and ask more personally, how's my life line up with that? Am I investing my life in the kingdom of God? Is my life being invested in kingdom work? Is my life being invested in what matters for eternity? Or am I one of those that might have gotten just a little bit sidetracked? And he's going to give us three examples. I love how Scripture shows us lives of people. You might want to now have your Bible open at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to pick up really where we ended three weeks ago. Uh, We referenced this verse. We're going to pick back up on that very verse where we ended, and we'll go forward looking at the life of Paul. 
So I hope you have your Bible, Philippians 2, verse 16. Just read with me. Now, I'll tell you what. Uh, let me set the context. He had just told them in verse 15, you need to be light in the world. In verse 16, he says, hold fast the word of life. Hold to the word. Live the word in your life. So that in the day of Christ, that's when his life ends. He comes face to face with Christ. He says, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Now, if you read those verses, you might go, what is that saying? What is he trying to say? He has a phrase there called a drink offering. Now, you might go, what in the world is a drink offering? You know, I mean, does that mean that, you know, I bought something, I took a drink? What, what does that mean, you know, a drink offering? Well, if you go back through the Old Testament, by the way, Paul uses this example more than once in his life to describe his own life. And I'm just going to simplify it. They would put a sacrifice on the altar, and then there would be an additional offering called a drink offering. And it would be like pouring out this drink offering over the burnt sacrifice. And it would be poured out completely. That's key. And sometimes, maybe not right on the altar, sometimes right in front of the altar. But either way, they're pouring out this drink offering to say, we worship you and give this to you, worshiping you. The aroma from that is part of my worship to you, God. I pour that out. Paul uses that to describe his life. Now, what does that mean? He's saying every one of our lives ought to be like a drink offering. Now, I don't know how you think. When you hear that, you go, Pastor, I'm not sure I get that. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that we need to go and be someone that is inconspicuous as a drink offering. <laughs> it's not even anything that's really like fascinating, beautiful, wonderful, but we pour it out not here, not here, but here, completely for him. That's what Paul's saying in this text. He is saying we are to fully give of ourselves so that people can know and grow in Christ. Paul is in jail. He writes a letter to them, and here's what Paul says. He goes, hey, he goes, guys, I don't want the end of my life to hear that I lived my life in vain. He says, I want to be able to invest and you could put your name in there, and I invest in you so much that my life, the Lord says, well done because you invested in the lives of other people. Well done because you gave it yourself. Now, I, I've been here now about 14 months and gotten to know some people, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, I went down to do a work for Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And I know that some in the room, some, one at least in the, that's a member of our church not here today, was at that very same location in First Baptist Slidell. And um, uh, Jeff, did you go there too? I remember that uh, I thought we'd had that conversation. And an, it's really amazing story at that church. I was a member of that church a long time ago, back in the early 90s. And Mike Clonch was the pastor. Mike is probably one of the most humble guys you'll ever meet. Uh, he is uh, recently retired he is, uh, I'm not sure how old Brother Mike, I still call him that. He was my pastor then. And um, Brother Mike, I, I showed up with a team to work there at Hurricane Katrina. You should have just saw that place. It was chaos. There's relief trucks wheeling in. There's the Red Cross over here. There's people bringing clothes over here. There's people bringing food over here. There's churches showing up right and left because everybody wants to help. He's trying to figure out how to get it all organized. I found out that he was in the midst of thinking of maybe even considering a call to another church <laughs> at the very moment that the hurricane just wiped out his whole community of where he's doing ministry at. I would go to a huddle meeting every morning where he was huddling with uh, people working in teams in that area, directing all of us. He's working who knows. 12, 14, maybe more than that, hours a day trying to keep the work going. They go in their church. It'd be, let's just use our room here. It'd be like strip everything out of the floor, strip all the pews out, 
put folding chairs up and cut the uh, sheetrock up about five feet and to all that's already just being ripped out to say, let's go and try to minister to this community and try to have a church service in here, which was beautiful, by the way, going to a church service there. You know what I found out? I found out that all that work he was doing, all the stuff he was spending time in doing, his house was flooded. His house was sitting in water. And you know what? He said, forget about me. I got to go worry about my community. I got to go worry about my church. I got to go worry about ministering to all of these people. That's what Paul's talking about here. And that's not supposed to be like something unusual. That's supposed to be our lives. And you see, when we, when we read that, we think, oh, man, that's like a superhero of the faith. No, it's saying that that's how we're to be as Christians. And Paul, even at the end of his life, he uses that same phrase again at the end of his life to say, I'm a drink offering. He said, there's nothing special about me. He said, I'm just supposed to go serve. You see, humility is another key mark of our life. You want to be a person used for God? He's saying, get this focus to say, I only want to be used for the kingdom. Let me tell you, I, I could sit here and tell you all stories for about the next two hours. I won't. But, you know, we had a team this week. I didn't plan to share this. It just hit me as I'm speaking here. I'll take one minute. We had a team working in uh, Partridge, Kentucky, and Lynch, Kentucky. And uh, never been to uh, either one of those uh, towns before. And I don't know, Partridge might be more of a community in, instead of a town there. But, uh, you know, we had a team there working. And I think the team that was there from our church would tell you they were blessed beyond measure with working there. But you know what struck me? I was able to spend um, uh, 24 hours maybe there. And... Um, of all the people they encountered that said, hey, it's not about us, it's about God. And let's go live for the kingdom, and let's go see how God can use our lives to surrender. To him. That's exactly what we're talking about right here. And see, we get sidetracked in having to focus on ourselves instead of ministry. And I want you to see one other way, and then we're going to dive into the next character. He says in verse 17, I rejoice and share my joy. He says, rejoice with me. He goes, let's be joyful. Now, I've said this before. Where is Paul? Say it with me. Where is Paul? Yes. And not only in jail, he's chained. He doesn't even really have freedom. Well, he didn't have freedom if he's, he's in prison. But, I mean, he can't even really move about freely. He writes about joy. You know why? Because he's reminding us that the path to joy is when we full of our give of ourselves for the kingdom of God. And the great deceiver, you remember, the devil is a deceiver. He's the father of lies that tell us in John 8, 44. That's who the devil is. And what does he deceive us with? The path to joy is stuff. The path to joy is things. The path to joy is my comfort. Is Paul in comfort here? Not at all, you know? And see, we think all of those things bring us joy. And he's reminding us in the text, no, that's not the path to joy. He said the path to joy is when we see all the things that need to be done for the kingdom of God. And we don't just see it, we jump in. And we said, let's go to work. And he said, that's the path to true joy. That's example number one. Now, I'm going to hit you with three, so we're going to keep moving pretty fast. Here's the second one. Verse 19. But he says, but I hope in the Lord Jesus, to send Timothy. Now, most of you know about Timothy, but I want you to just read this description of Timothy. He goes, uh, to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interest, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately. I'll stop there. Now, most of you know about Timothy. Timothy has godly mother, godly grandmother, Lois and Eunice. We talked about that uh, on Mother's Day. I remember us talking about that. But also, Timothy had apparently a ungodly, uh, heathen would be the word in that day and time, father that was not of God. Timothy became a follower of Christ. 
Timothy uh, locked up with Paul. By the time this is written, more than likely, Paul and Timothy have been together now for 10 years. Now, just use your imagination. Can you imagine what Timothy has seen in that 10 years? He has seen jail time. He, the, we, in Acts chapter 16, they're together, and Paul and Silas get thrown in jail, and Timothy didn't get thrown in jail, but Timothy's right there with him, you know? And so he has seen jail time, people running them out of town, people rejecting them, people upset, people angry, people they have to confront. Paul has written all kind of letters confronting people with their sin and telling them things they need to go address in their lives. He has seen everything, rejection, and now he sees Paul in jail long term. Now, I, don't, I want to say that you don't need to shake your head on this one either. Would you have maybe considered saying, I think I'm going to go do something else instead of being with Paul? It seems like this is pretty uncomfortable life. It seems like this is a tough life. I think I'm going to go try to figure out somewhere to just kind of live my life peaceably, and I'm going to get out of this Jesus business. You know, I'll still say I love Jesus, but let's don't do all this stuff. This is crazy. You know what Timothy did? Right there. Right there with Paul through thick and thin, no matter what. And look at the description there. He says, look at verse 20. I have no one else of kindred spirit who would genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interest. I'm going to hit two or three things. First of all, it reminds us. Now, that's an amazing verse. Paul knew a whole bunch of people. He said, there's nobody like Timothy who will care and concern, have care and concern for other people. He's a person that will just genuinely go out of his way to love you, greet you, welcome you, put his arm around you. But I want you to stop and think about 2023. How do we do this? Oh, I could give you an examples of a woman I knew in another church that she's reaching out to uh, other women in her church that were needy, reaching out to other women in her church that... Uh, needed encouragement, and she would go with them and uh, buy them a lunch and say, hey, let me encourage you. Let's talk about the things of God and investing her time and doing that week after week after week after week after week in her life, deep care and concern. But let's get back to more basic. I told you today was a little confrontational. How many people do you know in the church? How many people's names do you know in the church? You can't hardly do care and concern if you don't even know people in the church. You see, Timothy is 800 miles. Some estimates say it's a little further than that, from Philippi to here. But yet, remember, Timothy had been to that church. He had been there. He knew them. They knew him. Apparently, when he was there, Timothy had invested his life there, even for whatever. We don't know exactly the period of time there. But they knew, oh, Timothy's a guy that cares. He knows us. He knows people by name. Here's another one I'll challenge you with. Are you praying for people in your church? Do you pray by name for people in your church? Do you pray for cares and concerns for people in your church? Sometimes it just needs to be presence with someone and say, hey, you want to get a cup of coffee together? Hey, you want to grab a Coca-Cola and cheeseburger together, you know, or any of those kind of things. But are we spending time with care and concern for one another? That's the call of Christ. But sec uh, number five in your list is, but we can't quit. I am going to challenge you. One of the things that I've seen through the years in ministry is I've seen people do this. I'm on fire for Jesus, and I quit. I'm on fire for Jesus, and I quit. Or I see someone that says, I'm going to be all on fire for Jesus. Kids get grown. I'm out of here. I kind of pop in, but I don't have to be at church now because I don't have kids at church. Or somebody says, I'm so busy with all my kids, I'm not going to go to church, and then I'll try to get active when I'm 60. I want you to hear this. I could give you name. I wrote them in my study this week. I could give you name after name after name after name of people that one time that were in churches, active leaders, active in activity, active in service, and today they might drop in on occasion in church and they say, well, I got a lot of other things to go take care of now. That is not the call of Christ. 
Timothy never quit. Timothy never backed down. Timothy, here's the last thing. He was willing and available for whatever service he was called to go do. If you read this whole text, here's what he said. Hey, I'm about to send Timothy to you 800 miles. They didn't have a pickup truck to jump into. They didn't have some nice car to go into. More than likely, a lot of that, he walked it. I mean, can you imagine? And Timothy says, let's go. I'm ready to go minister to that church. I want to ask, are you willing and available to serve the Lord Jesus? Or is your first answer is, and I, some people will say, oh, I'm willing to serve as long as it's on my terms. I'm willing to serve as long as it's the way I want to serve. I'm willing to serve as long as it's in this, this place. This is the only place I want to serve. Don't ask me to serve anywhere else. I'm willing to serve. Uh, I can use those examples because, believe me, I've got lots of examples to share on that. But here's the thing. Timothy, it doesn't appear from the text, says, hey, I'll go serve as it's long down, down the street. I kind of like some of the food in that place. No. You know, are you willing to serve? He goes, yeah, I'll go take the 800-mile trip. I know there's robbers on the road. Yeah, I know I could lose my life on the road. Yeah, I know that it's going to be a a group i got to go minister to, but I'm willing and available. Now, you may be about like me in studying this this week. You might go, enough. No, we're going to look at my favorite character in the story now. We're going to look at Epaphroditus. Look at verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. And yes, I did look up how to pronounce the word. And so, and it says, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Read verse 25 slowly. He is a brother to Paul, a worker with Paul, a soldier with Paul a messenger from the church at Philippi, a minister to Paul. Wow, what a description that Paul gives of this guy. Paul has encountered tons of people in his ministry. He says, let me tell you about Epaphroditus. He goes, he's my brother. He's a fellow worker. He's a fellow soldier. He goes, this guy has been beside me through thick and thin. He is my brother. That's the call of Christ in the church. By the way, that's part of what Jeff is mentioning to us on Thursday night in our men's Bible study. He even mentioned to us this week, he said, hey, by the time we get to the end of this, we want to spend more time on how we can go and foster that relationship and be brothers to one another. That's exactly what it's talking about here. That's the call of Christ. That is exactly, he's saying, I tell you what, you answer me. Does everybody in here at some point in your life need encouragement? Yeah. Does all of us need encouragement every week? Yeah. You know, I said some point in your life. No, we need encouragement all the time. I wrote down names this week. You probably have people popping in your mind right now. I can think of a uh, pastor that's in his 80s right now that's been an encouragement to me for years and years and years and years. Just picks up the phone and calls me. You know, he's a brother. He's a fellow worker. He's a soldier. He struggles now to get up to the pulpit to preach because of his uh, physical problems. But he's still trying to get, how can I get the word out? He's a fellow worker and a fellow soldier. I can think of someone else. When I went to China my first time to share the gospel, there was a guy there from Minneapolis. I'd never met the guy in my life. We met, I think, in the Detroit airport before we boarded that 13-hour flight to go hop on. And... uh, He uh, did nothing that whole week but encouraged me. I felt like half the time, am I doing anything, any good here? And he'd be coming alongside me and said, man, you're doing a great job. He said, I really appreciate what you're doing. I learned something from what you said today, da-da-da-da-da. You know, he'd say, what was he doing? Encouraging me. That's who we're to be in Christ. I want to ask you right now, are you encouraging someone in this room Are you encouraging one or two or three people in this room? Are you investing your life in someone? You see, sacrifice is this whole text. This entire text is saying, are we going to live for Jesus? Then it can't be us saying it's all about me. It can't be all of us saying everything's got to be the way that I want it to be. The Christian life is saying, Lord, I am yours I will do what you want. If it means jail time like Paul, 
Okay. If it means being the servant to Paul and Paul says, I need you to go to Philippi and take an 800-mile hike, okay. If it's Epaphroditus and he walked, he's already gone the 800 to him from Philippi and now he says, you're going to go back, Epaphroditus. And if you read this text, I didn't read the whole text. If you look at it there, it says there in verse 26, he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. And indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him. He almost died there away from home. You ever been on the road and sick away from home? It's one of the awfulest feelings in the world. He couldn't even get in his own bed and be with his own family and be with his own friends. That was Epaphroditus. If you look at the very last verse in this chapter, it says, He came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. That's not a negative what he's saying is, is, hey, some of you couldn't be here to minister to me, and he ministered in your name. He's reminding us we give of our lives at great risk. And, you know, when I was preparing this message, I thought, this is one of these messages that people are going to go, whoa. I mean, this is pretty challenging, and this is scary, and this is uh, kind of a tall order for me. So I want you to spend, we're going to spend an extra few minutes. I want you to think, how do you respond? I want you to stop and think for just a minute. Number one question, am I saved by the grace of God? That should be our first question. When we're opening up the word, am I a person that is saved by his grace, that I know my sin has kept me apart from God, and that I turn to Jesus Christ in faith, and Jesus Christ is my Savior and I've turned to him in faith. He alone is my Savior. He paid it all. He did it all. If you can't say that, that's where you need to stop today, is to say, I need Jesus as my Savior. But if you're a Christian, I want to just put something in front of you right now. We must understand the call of Christ. We must understand the call of Christ. He has not called us in this room to be half-hearted. He has not called us to come and to be a pew sitter two or three times a month and nothing else. And I'm not trying to be ugly when I say that. I'm trying to confront, though, because the Scripture tells us that we're to be active and in the game and serving the Lord fully. We're to deny ourselves, present ourselves on the altar of God. And we, I put in your notes there, we've tried to redefine that and just act like if we go to church a little bit, we're good. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we follow him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So let's stop today and ask ourselves, where are we? The call from Scripture is to die to ourselves. Our our great struggle, our great struggle is we want everything our way. We want to serve God on our terms. We want to serve God where it's something that really doesn't cost us anything, and we can do that, and we can look good, and maybe even ease our conscience, and then we go on and live our life our way. I know that's a little hard. But truly, Scripture tries to confront us with that to say, lay aside yourself and ask yourself, am I willing to go serve the living God because he died on a cross? Don't miss the preceding verses. In the preceding verses, he's already told us that Jesus was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he also reminds us that he's the one that's worthy of confessing him as Jesus as Lord. So how do we do it? Christ's goals must become our goals. Not my goals must become God's goals. That's what we say. We kind of want to say, hey, God, here's what I want to happen. Would you do all of these things for me? And the Lord says, no, submit your life and say, Lord, not my will, but yours. And I put in the notes there, the only way that's going to happen is us to spend time with him and strengthen our relationship with him. It just won't happen any other way. We have to come to the realization that the Lord has, I think I, I think some of you know, last weekend before the um, uh, Kingsman Quartet, I had spoke three times that weekend with college students. And I told these college students, I said, listen, you have the highest calling in the world on your life. 
God has called you to be his messenger. God has called you to be his ambassador. Go pursue his goals. It's the best life is living for him. But it requires a focus on eternity and not a focus on today. The big struggle for us is we don't intentionally meet it, but this right here gets pushed aside because we get busy. I'll just speak for the crowd here. We get busy and we push this aside. We get bitter or angry, our feelings or get upset about something, and we get self-centered, and we get focused on ourselves, and we can't lay that aside. Or we'll get over here and we say, I've got to do this much. I've got these temporal goals. I've got to make this much money, and I've got to have this many things, and I've got to do this thing and achieve this title, and we focus on all of those things. And you know what? Not one of those things is going to matter on our last day that we take our dying breath. They're not going to matter. What matters is the things of eternity, salvation of souls and investing so that people can grow in Christ so they can tell more people about Jesus Christ as Savior. That's what matters for eternity, and we get it all messed up. I'm including myself in that. We get it all messed up. But if we want to live like Epaphroditus and Timothy and Paul, we have to stop and say, is my focus on eternity? Or things of today. We also must have, and we can only do this through selflessness, we must love and serve others. I find it interesting in Philippians 2, verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. And then he comes down there in chapter 2, and he's talking about Timothy, and he says, They all seek after their own interest. He almost uses the exact same words. He's saying most of the people are selfish. But he said, Oh, Timothy... He's figured it out to be outwardly focused and not inwardly focused. And he's reminding us, pray for one another, encourage one another, love one another. Come alongside somebody when they're hurting. Come along somebody when they're in sin and say, hey, how do I help you get out of this mess? We must love and serve. Now, you can answer this question. What is our number one hindrance to today's message? There it is. Y'all don't have to say amen. But y'all know it's true. I know it's true for me. Our selfishness and self-centeredness must be the hindrance that's addressed. So how do we respond to today? How do we take this passage of Scripture, the Lord records a number of verses telling us about these lives. Why? He wants us to stop and say, where is my life and how am I investing it? I want you to bow your heads. And if you don't mind, just with your head bowed, I want you to ask yourself, where is my life in Christ? Am I saved by his grace? Is he my savior? If you are not saved, I encourage you today to talk to me. Don't walk out of here ignoring that. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I want to ask you right now, where is your life's focus right now? Where's your investment of your life? Where's your heart? What's your heartbeat? Do you want to see more people saved? And are you not just talking about it, but you're investing in it? Are you really wanting to go and be with brothers and sisters in Christ, growing together as Christians? Are you even coming in a life group or at Bible studies here at church? Are you getting engaged? You see, the Christian life is not a spectator. Christian life is to be engaged, fully serving and following Him. I ask you to ask yourself right now, before the Lord, where are you? 
Lord, I ask that your spirit will lead each of us. I pray, God, in my own life, for these characteristics of these men to be more in my life. I pray that for each of us in this room. I pray, Lord, that you'll see those characteristics shown in Buena Vista Baptist Church. I pray, Lord, that we'll be a community that grows and serves you, lives for you. Lead us by your Spirit. Lord, I pray that we will lay aside ourselves. I pray, Lord, that each day we'll call, come before you and call on you. Thank you for the great grace of God. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you can stand. We're going to have an invitation. And uh, we, we have an invitation. If you're visiting with us today, we have an invitation to say, hey, where's your life? Do you know Jesus as Savior? If you don't, I encourage you to come and let us talk with you. Or maybe you need a church home. We'd love to talk to you about that. Or maybe you need to say, I got things in my life I need to pray about. I encourage you to do it at the pew. Do it here at the altar. Come and pray with me. But I say this. Many times you've heard me say it. Don't ignore the word. Let's sing.